podcast 19. Hello, welcome. Today we are looking at really recent subjects. I haven't been with you for like a month, although it probably is a little bit more recent because I had two or three in the bag. But yeah, articles that are quite recent and quite in, I don't know, trending or style. Today we are talking about the Black Death and Parliament and Paddington Bear munching on his tomato, uh, not tomato sandwiches, munching on his tomato, his tomato, I've done it again, munching on his marmalade, marmalade orangey sandwiches. Oh my gosh, that is trial of the week. Oh, so can't wait. Anyway, first article, article one. Article one is from the Guardian, theguardian.com and it's called Mass Grave Show How Black Death Devastated the Countryside and it's basically a mass grave full of people and it was a bubonic plague. So, mass grave shows how the Black Death devastated the countryside. Grave in Lincolnshire dates to medieval pandemic of 1348 and reveals rural, so that means countryside, plague catastrophe. A mass grave containing the remains of a dozen victims of the Black Death offers chilling new evidence of the speed and scale of the devastation the plague brought to rural England. According to archaeologists, the grave, discovered in a remote corner of rural Lincolnshire, has been dated to the 13th century, almost certainly to the earliest and the deadliest medieval outbreak of the disease in 1348-9. It contains the bodies of at least 48 men, women and children. Oh, that's so sad. Oh no. Who were laid in a sandy pit within days of each other. DNA tests on the bodies found the plague pathogen, which is the genes of the plague. The basically the DNA of the plague, confirming how they died. But half the population in England was wiped out within 18 months by the 1348-9 to pandemic. Perhaps surprisingly, how the direct archaeological evidence for the Black Death is extremely rare, according to Hugh Wilmot, a senior lecturer of European history, historical archaeology at the University of Sheffield. Imagine saying all that if you're at a cocktail party with two metre distances who led the excavation. While a small number of plague mass graves have been excavated in London, he said nothing comparable has ever been found in a rural context, making this discovery of national importance. Analysts of the find made in 2013 has been published and made public for the first time in the antiquity, and then they've got a they've got a soundbite for him. One of the assumptions in the past has been perhaps you get mass graves in towns where you have the highest density of people, whereas in villages people were buried as normal in parish church, said Wilmot. But actually what suggests is they suggest is that this was a rural community that couldn't cope and when the Black Death hit and arrived the normal system for doing things broke down. The grave was discovered by chance during a survey of the now ruined Priory of Thornton Abbey, close to a place in North Lincolnshire on the east coast of England. Nearby archaeologists found the site of medieval hospital attached to the priory, suggesting the dead and dying had been brought there in desperation as the plague struck, overwhelming who were then forced to bury them together. People couldn't be buried in the parish graveyard. Perhaps the priests or the gravediggers had died. Oh, I didn't think of that. So you turn to the church, the canons at the Yabby down the road. This is a snapshot of not often seen rural life catastrophe. While the layout of the bodies show they had been buried within a period of days, said Wilmot, they had not been flung without ceremony and into a shared pit. Instead, the victims, more than half were children, oh that's so sad, were shrouded and laid carefully side by side. They're trying to treat them as respectfully as possible, even though it is the height of terrible disease and disaster. They're taking as much care as they can with their dead. So, it's very sad. What can I say about that? Um, it rings a few bells of what we're doing, what we're going through now. Yeah, but we can learn from history and we can learn from the past. So, Article 2. 
parliament.uk. Ooh, and it says, secret doorway rediscovered in the House of Commons. News from Parliament. Oh, I wonder what it was like. A secret doorway created for the procession of the coronation banquet of Charles II. So that's that's 1600s. Um, has been rediscovered in the House of Commons. Historical doorway rediscovered. For centuries, the entrance would have been used by great political luminaries, such as the diarist Samuel Pepys and the first de facto Prime Minister of Great Britain, Robert Walpole, and the arch-rivals Charles James Fox and William Pitt the Younger. Brass plate mark where the doorway had once been in Westminster Hall. Historians believe it had been filled in following the reconstruction work after the palace was bombed during the Second World War. However, following the investigation work by Parliamentary Architecture and Heritage Team, working on research for the Palace of Westminster's restoration and renewal programme, the passage has been rediscovered. Sir Lindsay Hoyle, a part of our parliamentary history. House of Commons Speaker Sir Lindsay Hoyle was the first senior member of the first senior member to visit the find. He said, to think this walkway has been used by so many important people over the centuries is incredible. I am so proud of our staff for making the discovery and I really hope this space is celebrated for what it is and a part of our parliamentary history. Mark Collins, we really thought it had been walled up forever after the war. Mark Collins, parliamentary estate historian, said he and his colleague had been on a high ever since the fantastic discovery. He added, to say we were surprised is an understatement. We really thought it had been walled up forever after the war. Graffiti from Bricklayers. There was also graffiti from Bricklayers who helped Sir Charles Barry restore the palace following the fire of 1834. One vivid piece of wall writing left by the men who helped block up the passage on both sides in 1851 read, This room was enclosed by Tom Porter who was very fond of old EL so he likes his beer. He does like his beer. Finally, the graffiti notes, these masons were employed refacing, repairing the cloister. August 11th, 1851. Real Democrat. Okay, I can't say anything about that. Signing off as the Real Democrat suggests that the group was part of the working class male suffragette chartist movement, which called for reformation, including allowing every man aged 21 to have a vote and would be MPs to stand even if they did not have property, he said. That's amazing. A switch probably installed in 1950s following the restoration work after the Second World War not only worked but it illuminated the large bulb marked HMM government property. So it's been bricked up since the early 50s. So basically it was bricked up in the 1800s and then rediscovered in the 1950s who then bricked it up again. So there we go. Now trial of the week is... Trial of the week is the iconic film character statue unveiled in Leicester Square. He looks so cute. He is Paddington Bear and it's by the Londoners.com. It's Paddington Bear who's so cute. Oh, Leicester Square is now fully full of excitement. But now visitors can now watch their favourite film character come to life. Yesterday, thanks to the Heart of London Business Alliance and Westminster Council, Westminster City Council, imagine saying that in all one mouthful, bronze statue of nine legendary film characters was unveiled in Leicester Square. Oh, that's amazing. When you first enter the square, there's a map guiding you to where the beloved characters are, although you won't need any help to spot the first few. Sitting on a bench facing in front of the Shakespeare statue, oh my god! Facing the front of the Shakespeare statue is the eccentric Mr Bean dressed in his signature smirk and suit. He was by far the most popular attraction just as onlookers waited in line just to have their picture taken next to the incompetent goof. Yeah, oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's so good. Just around the corner is Bugs Bunny surrounded by a favourite snack as well as his trusty mailbox. To the right of everyone's favourite 
Rabbit is Jean Kelly from Singing in the Rain, reenacting the famous lamppost swing. Oh, we've got to do a, a video about that. I'll go, we'll do a, a live action video about this. Oh gosh. There also lies Airy Mary Poppins, a group of schoolgirls stood staring upwards in awe of the fictional nanny, waiting to take a picture under her magical umbrella, possibly hoping to fly away with her. Speaking of powerful women, in honour of the upcoming Wonder Woman film, Wonder Woman 1984, you can find the superhero as she dramatically bursts through one of the walls in the square. Oh, that's amazing. Thinking about eating your lunch in the square? Enjoy a meal with Paddington Bear while he is depicted eating his trademark marmalade sandwiches. How many sandwiches could one bear possibly need? I think, I think that's a video. We'll go and uh, find the statues. Oh, that would be amazing. I can't wait for that. So, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's a few videos that like that. But we'll do our own. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Please like, please share, and please wash your hands, keep safe, and self-isolate. Keep inside as much as possible.